Well, as we uh, begin uh, this two-week study that uh, I mentioned last week, uh, I want to, uh, to say a couple things at the outset because it's important to have an idea of what we as, as Christians believe when it comes to the rightful uh, role and responsibility of the government, or as we often say, the state. Uh, we believe as a church and as believers that the state derives its authority uh, through the delegation of divine authority given to them by God himself. Meaning that the state, whether it acknowledges it or not, is ultimately answerable and accountable to God. Uh, we, we see a, a state uh, today that would often uh, uh, try to hide behind the idea of separation of church and state. Um, but the reality is, is that whether we say church and state are separate or not, every human being on this earth and every government is accountable to God. That's right. We believe that as a church. The state also has what we call the right of the sword. And what we mean by that is, is that they can compel citizens to do certain things or not to do certain things. The Bill of Rights, however, of the U.S. Constitution sets up boundaries for how far the U.S. government can go in carrying out the right of the sword. And that's why it's important as, uh, as Americans and as American Christians that we're not only familiar with the U.S. Constitution, but we're also familiar with the Bill of Rights. Because that, those Bill of Rights are not the rights that the government has. Those Bill of Rights are the rights that the citizens have. Right. And we have to be familiar with that. We also understand that while it, uh, we live in what in essence is called a free society, that every single law enacted by a legislative body restricts someone's freedom. That's what laws do. Meaning that complete freedom is not, not possible. Think about it for a second. If, I, if we make a law that says you can't steal from a supermarket, does that restrict somebody's freedom? Yeah, it restricts the thief's freedom. And we say, well, of course, we want to restrict their freedom, but we can't say that we're completely and totally free because we have to restrict certain people's freedom at certain times. If we make a law that says that you can drive no faster than 70 miles per hour on I-5, we're restricting somebody's freedom, right? Now, if you've driven on I-5 lately, you know that almost nobody actually pays attention to that law, but yet it's the law nonetheless. Okay? It's important to make these type of things clear because we as the church believe that governments have a necessary and in fact a God-ordained role to play within the society that we live in. We are not a church, we are not a people who say, uh, well, we don't have any need for a government and forget the government, we don't care what they say about things. We understand that there is a necessary and God-ordained role for the government. But the question that we're going to wrestle with over the next two weeks is, as believers, as Christians, when do we comply with what the government says? And when do we dissent from what the government says? This week we're going to look at the first one of those questions, and then next week we'll spend time looking at the second question there. And so this morning we're going to look in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7, which are really the classic text when it comes to answering this particular question, why, or what does God's word say about consenting to the government authorities? Now, before I get into that, as you turn to Romans chapter 13, I do want to give a, a little bit of a preface of this text because it's pretty important. Okay? Sometimes as we read a text like this, it's very tempting for them to, for us to go, yeah, that, that okay, I get that, but, but, but Paul didn't understand what we're facing. Paul didn't understand who was president of our country. Paul didn't understand who would become president of our country. He didn't know what our senator or our congress would be like. He certainly didn't know who our governor would be. If he knew who our governor would be, certainly he wouldn't write this. But here's the problem that we often forget. Paul is writing this letter to the church in Rome. At the time that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome, the emperor was Nero. One of the nastiest human beings to ever walk the earth and one of the people who hated the church as much as anybody else in the history of the world. The other power in Rome was the Senate. And though the Senate, 
the Roman Senate wasn't as bad as Nero, that's a pretty low bar. They weren't much better. Both were sinful to the core, both hated Jews, and therefore they hated what they saw as a cult of Judaism, Christianity. So understand that when Paul writes this, he's not saying the government is your friend. Paul knew better. In fact, it's very likely that it was Nero who eventually had Paul killed. So understand as we, we get into this and we hear what Paul says here, he's not saying that the Roman government is the friend of the church. In fact, what we're going to find here is Paul doesn't say anything about the expectations on the government per se in here. What is focus here is how are you as a Christian to respond to a godless government? Here's the reality. There's never been in the history of the world a godly government. There were some governments that were more godly than others, but there's never in the history of the world been a godly government. And guess what? Until Christ comes back, there won't be. And when Christ comes back, he'll set up a theocracy. And it will be perfect. And it will be good. Why? Because God will be at the head. So let's discuss what Paul says here. Look in verse, uh, chapter 13, starting in verse 1. It says, Paul says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there uh, is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So as we look at that, and we think about in light of who was the emperor and, and, and the, the Roman Senate, who were the authorities in Paul's day, and then within Paul's own context of his constant dealing with the Jewish authorities, we may ask the question, why in the world would Paul write this? Why would Paul write this? Well, I've got some reasons why I believe that Paul wrote this. First one is, is that if we look back and we, we look just a, a chapter before this, Paul says this in chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now it's very possible that when, when people heard this in the church, they may have mistakenly heard that Paul was saying that, hey, guess what? I'm being transformed. I'm not part of this world, and so your government doesn't matter to me, and I'll do whatever I want. And so Paul balances that out to help them understand that, no, 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 that's not the right thoughts. That's not the right way to respond to it. See, understand that when Paul writes, Paul didn't just wake up one day and go, you know what, I think I'll write to the church in Rome. And I think I'll say these things to him because I feel like it. Okay? Every letter in Scripture is what we call an occasional letter. Now, Baptist, that doesn't mean that we read it occasionally. <laughs> what it means is that it was written for a specific occasion. There was a specific reason why Paul wrote every letter that he wrote. And, and the things that he addresses in these letters was something that applied to them where they lived at that time. So when he challenges on things, we do what we call mirror reading. Okay? Meaning that we, Paul might not say, this is why I'm saying this, but we can assume that if Paul says something, he's saying it for a reason. That it's something that hits home with them. It speaks to where they're at. Another reason why it's very likely that Paul wrote this is that there was probably still some very bad sentiments, especially within the Jewish population that were in Rome. Why? Well, because under Emperor Claudius, Emperor Claudius decided that he didn't want the Jews in Rome anymore, so he expelled them all. He said, everybody get out. Everybody who's Jewish, get out. Ran them all out of Rome. Now, they had since then been able to come back but with that, there were probably Christians 
And even if there weren't Christians in that group, there were Jews who would later become Christians that Paul is writing to here. Now imagine for a second, put yourself in that situation. Okay? Let's say you're just living in the state of Washington in the home that you've always lived in. And all of a sudden, the governor decides, you know what? I'm sick of you Christians sending me emails and bothering me about stuff. Everybody who's a Christian, get out. And you left the state. And you had to go without the things that you own, only the things you could carry on your back, and you had to leave for a while. But then later you came back. Do you think you'd have a little bit of resentment there? Yeah, yeah just a little bit. So it's very likely that the people within the church that Paul's writing to had a little bit of resentment going on. Paul's encouraging them not to hold on to that resentment, not because they were, it's, 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 it's okay sometimes to say, yes, I was wronged, and it was wrong that I was wronged. But Paul's encouraging them not to retaliate. Also, we need to understand that during this time, the Jewish zealous move, zealot movement was on the rocks. What is the Zealot Movement? The Zealot Movement is the idea uh, that many Jewish people, especially in, uh, in Jerusalem and throughout Israel, had that we need to stand against the Roman authorities. Rome doesn't belong in Israel. We need to get them out. But waiting on God, waiting on His Messiah, is taking too long. So what we need to do is we need to kind of help it along. And the way that we're going to help it along is we're going to start creating riots. And we're going to start creating problems. And so groups like the Sicari Rose. The Sicari were called the, uh, the Sicari because it meant dagger men. And what they would do is they would take a long dagger and they would put it in their, their tunic. And they would go into a large crowd of people and they would usually stab somebody. Oftentimes a Roman, but sometimes even a Jewish person. And then they would run off and it would create a panic and then it would create a riot. And they wanted that because they felt like the way to bring revolution was through armed conflict, through battles, through fighting. We need to get Rome out by any uh, means necessary. The Jewish uh, zealot movement was on the rise and eventually what the, Jew the, the, the uh, Jewish uh, zealot movement would lead to is what we call the Jewish revolt. And it was during the Jewish revolt that started in AD 66 and ended in AD 70 that the temple would be destroyed as Rome came with a very powerful fist to slam it down on the Jewish people. So it's, it's possible that, that even some of those zealot feelings were, 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 were uh, uh, resonating with the people that were even in Rome at the time. And also there was a heavy taxation burden by the Romans that likely caused resistance by Christians, especially because Jews and Christians were seen as subhumans to many of the Roman people. So they had to pay taxes, but yet the, 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 those in power saw them as subhumans. Good thing we don't experience that anymore, right? Good thing to know that our tax money is always used for the right purposes today, right? Yeah, amen or oh me. <laughs> well, I think all of those things are true, but the biggest reason is actually found right in this text. Look again what he says. He says, For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So Paul has a recognition here of God's sovereignty in all things. Paul believed in God's sovereignty, that God was sovereign over all things. Those who are in power are there because he willed it to be that way. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that those in power will glorify him. In fact, history is rife with people who were in power who didn't glorify God. Even within Jewish history. If you look in Israel, there's really only two or three good kings in Israel's history. There's only two who nothing bad is said about them. You can count on one hand the amount of kings in Israel's history who did more good things than bad things. And that's God's people. That's people who had the blessing of being given the Torah by God. You think the rest of us would get it? No. However, 
What Paul is teaching us here is that they are in place because of his providence and because his ultimate goals for humanity are going to be accomplished through it. So as the church, we need to remind ourselves of that all the time. That doesn't mean that we need to sit back and go, well, I'm glad this happened. No. If we don't like the way the election goes, it's okay to say, I didn't like the way the election went. It's fine. You can say that. If you don't like the way that our government is, is, is handling situations, it's okay. In fact, it's necessary for you to say that. But recognize that ultimately God is bringing history to the place that he wills it to be. And so God is in charge. As we've said through all of this stuff, God is not off the throne. God is on the throne still. Rebelling against authorities can be rebellion against God. Notice I didn't say rebelling against authorities always is rebelling against, the God, against God. That's not what the text says here. But rebelling against authorities can be rebelling against God. Remember the greatest example that we have, Jesus himself. How did Jesus respond when he was wronged by the authorities? First of all, was Jesus wronged by the authorities? The correct answer is yes, he was. Very much so. How did Jesus respond to that? Recognizing that God had ordained all things for his purposes. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Bear this in mind. This is God's will for me. And somehow, some way, he'll bring glory to himself for it. That should be what we hold on to. Now, some people will hear us say that as, as the church will say, well, that seems pretty fatalistic. It seems, like, it seems like we're just saying, well, whatever happens to us, it is whatever happens to us. No, sometimes God calls us to a place in time to step out in faith in a bold way. Think about one of my favorite Old Testament books, the book of Esther. What is it that Esther is told? Whether you choose to do this or not is really on you. Don't think that you alone can save Israel. But maybe, just maybe, you've been brought to this time for such a time as this. To do this to save Israel. So the reality is, is that this isn't fatalistic at all. But it gives us a good grounding. It gives us a good foundation of what it is to recognize the authority and God's hand in it. That God is sovereign over all. To recognize that even though not every decision that those in authority are going to make are going to glorify God, in fact, many of them don't, but that we recognize that God's hand is involved in it. And that his purposes will ultimately be done regardless. Look at what it goes, the, the, the rest, or some more of the text says. It says in verse 3 For the rulers are not a terror to good conduct. But to bad, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Now let me put that in very simple terms. One should submit to the authorities because they have been given the power to punish wrongdoers. And because it's the right thing to do according to God. That's in essence a very simplified version of what Paul just said. Those in authority have been given the right to punish wrongdoers and because we want to be, we want to have our conscience clear. We want to be right before God. Now understand, again, let me, let me emphasize this again because I don't want anybody walking out of here thinking that I'm saying something that I'm not. Paul is not giving a free pass to corrupt officials. He's not. Make no mistake about it, he is giving no free passes here to corrupt officials. 
In fact, Paul doesn't really say anything particularly to the corrupt officials here. He's talking to the church. The old saying is true. The only person that we can really change is ourselves. In our form of government, we have a little bit more of a voice than they did in Paul's day. But yet, can I, as one man, change the government completely? Probably not. But I can do what's right. I can take the stand that I need to take. Paul's point here is that the authority, authorities rarely harass people who obey the laws. Typically, it's those who are looking to cause problems that face the wrath of the authorities. Now I know, just saying that, somebody out there is thinking, but, but, do they sometimes harass people unjustifiably? Absolutely yes. Sometimes they do. But generally speaking, and that's what Paul's getting at here. He's speaking in generalities. Generally speaking, when we follow the laws, we typically will avoid run-ins with the authorities. It always cracks me up when somebody gets pulled over and complains about it, and I ask them, well, what were you doing wrong? Well, I was driving, you know, I was only driving 75 miles per hour. What's the speed limit? It's 70, but everybody else was doing it. I don't care. We break the law, we break the law. Whether we think the law is justified or not is neither here nor there. Additionally, Paul is not saying here that civil disobedience is wrong. He's not saying that at all. In fact, next week I'm going I'm to focus the entire ser uh, sermon on when we need to dissent. And we're going to see biblical examples and historical examples of when godly Christian people dissented to the authorities. So we're going to see that. We'll be there. But th some things to bear in mind. Our circumstances are different than in Paul's day. Okay? We understand our experience because of what we've lived in. Every single one of us, for almost all of our life, and many of, most of us, all of our life, have only ever lived in what we call a representative republic. People call it a democracy. America is not a pure democracy. It's a representative republic. We send representatives that are supposed to represent us. Glad thing it works that way all the time, right? Yeah, not so much. Okay? So we do have a voice at least somewhat because we have these representatives. And again, I was impressed. I reached out to a couple of representatives about this whole not singing in church thing. And I actually got some responses from some of them. One in particular has been very cordial and very understanding. It tells me that even though many times I feel as a, as a Christian, as a conservative, I don't have much of a voice, that tells me that, hey, at least I have a voice with one person. And at least that's something, right? In Paul's day, there was no such thing. Publicly speaking out against the authorities led to persecution. That's what would happen in Paul's day. That's what they could expect. Paul is likely here protecting the church from unnecessary persecution. What do I mean by unnecessary persecution? Okay? What I mean is that if persecution was to come, as Paul knew it was... Let that be not because the believer was doing something to incur the wrath of the Roman authorities. Paul knew that persecution would come, but he wanted the people to be innocent before God. Another thing to think about, resistance. Resistance takes different forms and can either be helpful or hurtful. In Paul's day, because they didn't have a voice, most resistance was done violently. And quite frankly, throughout history, violent resistance usually ends up failing, especially when they were facing the power of Rome. Today, Western believers, we do have a bit of a voice. Nonviolent resistance is always what's best. If it's done in an honorable, 
glorifying, God-honoring way. In fact, if you look throughout our, just our, our American history, many of the people that we look at and hold in the highest regard are those who resisted authority in the right way, in an honoring way. People have a right to protest in America, right? But once they start throwing rocks through windows, once they start punching people, it changes, right? As it ought to. It's no longer a protest. It's bad people doing bad things. And they can think that they're doing it for the right reasons, but doing the wrong thing for the right reasons is never okay. Never. Another thing to remember is that submission isn't the same thing as obedience. We think so in our American uh, lexicon because we see submission and obedience as the same thing. In, in the Greek, it was nothing like that. And in, in Paul's day, in the way that they thought, it was not like that. Paul says submit, but notice he doesn't specifically say obey. When he uses the word submit, Submit means that one person recognizes the rightful leadership role of another human being over his life. So that's why, like when we look at Ephesians, and Paul says, wives submit to your husbands, and American wives are like, oh no, he didn't. <laughs> because we tend to think, oh, that means that he needs to be the Lord over her and tell her everything that she needs to do. Wrong, that's not what Paul is saying. It's not what he's saying at all. It means that she submits to the authority of her husband, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she's going to obey everything he says, because if he tries to get her to sin, she has to say no. Why? Because as much as she is under the authority of her husband, she's more so under the authority of God. So don't mistake and think that every time he says submit, it's the same thing as obedience. It's not. I can submit to somebody's authority and obey up until that person is attempting to make me do something that God forbids or tries to forbid me from doing something that God commands. At that point, I still recognize their authority, but I can no longer obey. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. Paul says, for because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers to God, of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. That submission extends to our, to our money. And the way that we treat one another. That's in essence what Paul is getting at here. Paul is not saying the tax code is right. Don't think that Paul's looking at that. Looking at this saying, yep, we need to pay more taxes, in fact. That's not what Paul's saying at all. That's not what he's getting at here. What he's saying is, as much as we can, as people, pay what you're supposed to pay. The church needs to spend a lot less time worrying about the tax code and a lot more time worrying about who's lost and needs to know Jesus is saved. Who we need to bring the gospel to. He mentions two things in particular here. Taxes and revenue. Taxes were direct payments to the government, like our income tax or something like that. Revenues were indirect governmental assessments, like customs and duties and things like that. So Paul's, in essence, what Paul is doing here, again, like I said before, is he's protecting the church. He's saying, church, don't be persecuted because you refuse to pay taxes. Don't be persecuted because you refuse to pay what you owe. Don't be persecuted because you refuse to show respect in the way that you're supposed to show respect. Don't be persecuted because you refuse to show honor to those who deserve honor. In essence, what Paul's getting at here is don't, be, don't have persecution come because of your own behavior. Your own wrong behavior. So why should Christians consent to the governing authorities? Three things to mention here briefly. First of all, because we're actually 
submitting to God's divine, uh, the sovereign purposes more than the human leaders over us. That's in essence what Paul gets at the, the beginning of this. We submit to God's divine authority and purposes more than the human leaders over us. It's not about what the governor said or what the president says or anybody else says. It's about what does God say. Because guess what? Government authorities will come and go, but God's word stands forever. Amen? Second, because our good behavior will ultimately result in good outcomes. Our good behavior will ultimately result in good outcomes. Now, does that mean that if we do right, good stuff will happen to us in this life? No, it does not. That's not what Paul would teach. What he would teach is that if we do the right thing, ultimately we would be blessed by God. It might not be on in this earth, and quite frankly, i got to tell you, any blessings that you get in this earth will pair, pale in comparison to one second in glory. I want to get just enough blessing in this life to get by because I want all my blessing to be stored up for heaven. Anybody else there with me? Yeah, because guess what? Any blessings you get out there, they're permanent. They're not going to go away. I just started putting up lights on my house yesterday, and, and, and as I'm, uh, I'm crawling around, grabbing on things, I'm feeling some stuff that's starting to get loose. That's always a fun thing in a house, right? And I'm reminded that, you know what? This thing is going to fall apart at different times. And as I was standing on the banister at the time outside, I'm thinking, I hope it doesn't fall apart right now. Because <laughs> when I was younger, I used to bounce when I would hit the ground. You, you, anybody remember that? Now I always break something, every time. <laughs> the things of this earth will fade. But we can be sure that when we do the right thing for the right reasons, God will bless us ultimately as his people. And also because the authorities have been given the right of the sword. Authorities have been given the right of the sword. That has been given to them by God. He says it here very clearly. Okay, For he is God's servant uh, to, uh, uh, for good, uh, but if you do wrong, uh, you should be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Paul's very clear that the government has been given the right of the sword. So let's get back to the first question I asked at the beginning of this message. When should Christians consent to the governing authorities? And basically at the heart of this question it is the question that I've heard a couple people ask this week, and it's a good question. Is Romans 13 an absolute injunction to obey the government authorities at all times? Is Romans 13 an absolute injunction that we have to, as the church, obey whatever the government says? And the answer is very clearly, no, it is not. And that was not Paul's intention behind Romans 13. In fact, we can look at Paul's life and his experience to find out that's not what he was teaching. We can look at other things he wrote other places. We can look at the experience of the early church. We can look at Christian history. And we can see over and over again times when people said, no more. So what, when should Christians consent to the governing authorities? First is this, we consent to the governing authorities when we are, when they commit, oh, oh, let me say this again, we consent to the governing authorities when they are not commanding us to do something that God forbids. Okay, so again, we consent to the governing authorities when they are not commanding us to do something that God forbids. Okay, so what I mean by that is, is that if they come in and command us to do something that God forbids, we don't have to do that. So if somebody from the government comes in and says, Pastor Ben, you need to do a wedding between these two men. I won't do it. I'll take my stand and say, no, I won't do it. Why? Because God forbids that. Yeah. You can't consent, command me to do something that God clearly forbids me to do. 
Second, we consent to the governing authorities when they are not forbidding us to do something or to, from doing what God commands. So again, we consent to the governing authorities when they are not forbidding us from doing what God commands. So if God commands us to do something and the governing authorities want to forbid us to doing that, at that point we have to say no more. So another example. We see him in the New Testament. In fact, we're going to look at him next week. Where the authorities tried to say, you can't preach the name of Jesus. If, they, if the governing authorities came in here and said, you know what, you can no longer preach certain parts of the New Testament. Can't preach Romans chapter 1 anymore, Pastor Ben. Guess what? Probably the next Sunday I preach Romans chapter 1. Yeah. Why? Because it's not the place of the government to tell us that we can't do something that God specifically commands us to do. It's not their role. So if they're not commanding us to do something that God forbids, and they're not forbidding us to do something that God commands, then we can consent. We also can consent when the governing authorities fulfill their God-ordained tasks. As we look throughout Scripture, we see that there are certain tasks, there are certain roles that governing authorities have. And I've really narrowed them down to three. Most all of them that you find in Scripture can be narrowed down to three. The first one is this, to protect human life. The government is there to protect human life. Specifically, its own people's human life. So let me tell you, I will always oppose any legal decisions made to support abortion. That's right. Because it's the job of the government to protect human life. I got news for you. COVID-19 has been the, the story of the year. <laughs> but at the end of the year, when it's all said and done, more people will have died because of abortion than COVID-19. That's right. <clears throat> Guess what? Last year... You know what the number one killer of human beings was? Abortion. And the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that. So as the church, we will continue to say, no, we oppose you on this. We can't agree with this because your job is to protect human life. Another thing that the government is called to do is to protect human property. To protect human property. The Bible is very clear. You shall not steal. You shall not steal. And that's true for us as individuals, right? We're not supposed to steal. I remember when I first became a Christian. And I was dealing with some serious guilt. Because I was reading, I was reading, I, I read through my Bible all the time. And I, I remember reading through uh, Exodus and, and looking at the Ten Commandments. And I realized that, that the pen I was using to write notes, I had taken from the bank. I didn't sleep well that night. <laughs> Nothing like walking into a bank and saying, I'm sorry, I stole your pen. And they look at you like, no, we give those away for free, sir. <laughs> Back here, take a couple more, you probably need them. <laughs> Is the role of the government to protect human property, and that means that people should not steal from each other, and guess what? By the way, the government shouldn't steal from people either. That's right. Yeah. I knew I'd get a reaction to that one. <laughs> One of the biggest amens I've gotten in all my preaching career. <laughs> Finally, to mediate, between, mediate human legal issues and disputes. To mediate human legal issues and disputes. Think about Moses. One of Moses' most important roles in Israel was to mediate disputes. In fact, it got so bad that eventually... His wise uh, father-in-law had to say, you're taking on too much. Get some other people to help you with this. God has always seen that there was a need for mediators between people. People who could come and supposed to be unbiased. To hear two sides and try to mediate between those. That's always been a rightful role of the government. 
And that's a role that they should fulfill. And so as the church, when we see that the governing authorities are protecting human life, are protecting human property, are mediating between legal issues and disputes, we can say, hey, I'll support that. I'll be behind that. The problem comes, as we'll see next week, when they don't do those things anymore. Then as the church, we have serious questions we have to ask. So I want to lay out a challenge for us this morning. The first, and there's actually a couple of challenges. The first challenge is this. We need to be in prayer for our church, for our community, for our leaders, for our governor, for our current president, for the next president. We might not like many of those people or any of those people. I didn't say pray for the people you like. We need to pray for those people. Why? Because God's Word tells us to. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for each other as a church. As I said, as we opened up this morning, when it comes to this issue that really was at the heart of a lot of this sermon series, these mask things and whether we can sing or not in a congregation, we are not on the same page as a church. We need to be in prayer for that. We need to be in prayer that God would give us wisdom. Be in prayer for the representatives that I've reached out to and talked to and the ones that I will be reaching out and talking to this week. Pray that wisdom will come in and they'll recognize that we have a vitally important part to play as the church in our community. The church matters a lot more than our governing authorities want to admit. Be in prayer. It's something that you can do. My second challenge is this. Right now, negativity is at an all-time high, I would argue. Maybe not historically, but in my lifetime, people are about as negative right now as ever before. And you know what? There's lots of reasons to be negative. I looked at the news this morning. Nearly a thousand people were murdered in Nigeria by Boko Haram yesterday. Most of the, most of the American news organizations didn't even cover it. It's the bottom of the page. But if you look at those who actually have a shred of objectivity, it was their top story. Why were they murdered? They were murdered because, they won't say this, but they were murdered because ultimately they were Christian people and Boko Haram is Muslims. That's right. Negativity all around us, beloved. We need to make things different. We need to be kind to people. We need to treat people with love. These masks might frustrate you. Trust me, they fr you know what frustrates me the most about these? Everybody else has been there too. You put these things on, and, and you walk from the warm place to a cold place. What happens to your glasses? Okay. Yeah. And I don't like running into things out on the street because I can't see. And then if you go from a cold place into a warm place, what happens? Fog up again, right? And then I go to take off the mask, and it gets caught up in my glasses, and my glasses always fall on the ground. It's frustrating. Oh, I match with hearing aids. They're frustrating. But you know what's more frustrating than that? People are grouchy more than ever before. Walk around Castle Rock. Castle Rock, one of the things I loved about Castle Rock when we first got here is it seemed like most of the people were, were just friendly. We have one or two grumps. But most people are friendly. I'm not going to use the names because they may or may not be in this room right now. <laughs> most of the people in Castle Rock are friendly, but right now they're not. People are grouchy. People are grumpy. People don't like this. Let's be a church that brings something different. Let's bring some joy into people's lives. I know they can't see you smile, but smile anyways. Say hello. Good to see you. Hold the door for people. Not you, Miss Pat. Let people hold the door for you, okay? 
Say thank you. The workers who are having to enforce mask rules that they don't want to, thank them for their work. Support local businesses. It seems like a weird thing to say from a sermon, but you know what? We want to make a difference in this community. I want people to feel like Castle Rock is the greatest community to live in in the United States of America. And I want to be part of that. Why? Because when Castle Rock does better, I believe the First Baptist Church Castle Rock will do better also. That's right. So let's make a difference in this community that we live in this week. Can we do that? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that in spite of the challenges that we face, Lord, that you have called us to be your people regardless of whether we like the circumstances, whether we agree with the circumstances, that we have been blessed to be your people. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would go about the business of being your people in this community, that people would hear your word and glorify you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.